Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. So I don't know about you, but I woke up today angry, angry and sad. And I felt that way because we have to revisit one of the darkest days in our nation's history. And you know what? It's going to hurt. And it's going to be traumatic for all Americans and anyone who experienced that awful day firsthand. But accountability is so important. So here we are. The attack on the Capitol was 202 days ago. And since then, we've had a new president sworn into office. Congress has studied the intelligence failures that led to that attack. And the Justice Department has prosecuted hundreds and hundreds of rioters. So it's easy to wonder what the exact purpose of a new select committee is. But if you went into the hearings today with that question in your head, you quickly realize that these hearings are important and they are absolutely necessary. And the chairman of the committee, Benny Thompson, and Republican Congressman, Congresswoman, excuse me, Liz Cheney, broke things down for us right off the bat. Some people are trying to deny what happened, to whitewash it, to turn the insurrectionists into martyrs. But the whole world saw the reality of what happened on January 6th. We need to understand how and why the big lie fested. We need to know minute by minute how January 6th unfolded. We need to understand how the rotten lie behind January 6th has continued to spread and feed the forces that would undermine American democracy. We must know what happened here at the Capitol. We must also know what happened every minute of that day in the White House. Every phone call, every conversation, every meeting, leading up to, during, and after the attack. Honorable men and women have an obligation to step forward. If those responsible are not held accountable, and if Congress does not act responsibly, this will remain a cancer on our constitutional republic. That line really stood out to me. A cancer on our constitutional republic. Congresswoman Cheney is one of the few Republicans that speaks the truth about what happened on January 6th. Other members of her party have spent the last few months downplaying and whitewashing the attempted coup we all watched on our televisions live. And Ron Johnson has called it a largely peaceful protest. It wasn't. Andrew Clyde compared it to a normal tourist with visit. It wasn't. Their most recent strategy has been to shift the blame from the Capitol rioters to their favorite boogie woman, Nancy Pelosi. And last time I checked, it wasn't Speaker Nancy Pelosi who asked the people to stop the certification by coming to Washington, D.C. and storming the Capitol. That was Donald Trump. The unfortunate truth is that for many Republican voters, though, that whitewashing may be effective, but it won't work on everyone. And it can't work if we don't want political violence like that to ever happen again. So it's only fitting that on day one of these hearings, we got a stunning reminder of just how chaotic and violent January 6th was from the officers on the front lines. And I just want to warn you, some of what you're going to hear is graphic and it's really upsetting. On January 6th, for the first time, I was more afraid to work at the Capitol than my entire deployment to Iraq. The physical violence we experienced was horrific and devastating. My fellow officers and I were punched, kick, shoved, sprayed with chemical irritants, and even blinded with eye-damaging lasers by a violent mob. To my perpetual confusion, I saw the thin blue line flag, a symbol of support for law enforcement more than once, being carried by the terrorists as they ignored our commands and continued to assault us. One woman in a pink MAGA shirt yelled, you hear that, guys? This n voted for Joe Biden. Then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo, n No one had ever, ever called me a n while wearing the uniform of a Capitol Police officer. As I was swarmed by a violent mob, they ripped off my badge. They grabbed and stripped me of my radio. They seized ammunition that was secured to my body. They began to beat me with their fists and with what felt like hard metal objects. 
At one point, I came face to face with an attacker who repeatedly lunged for me and attempted to remove my firearm. I heard chanting from some in the crowd, get his gun and kill him with his own gun. I was effectively defenseless and gradually sustaining injury from the increasing pressure of the mob. Directly in front of me, a man seized the opportunity of my vulnerability, grabbed the front of my gas mask and used it to beat my head against the door. He switched to pulling it off my head, the straps stretching against my skull and straining my neck. He never uttered any words I recognized, but opted instead for guttural screams. I remember him foaming at the mouth. For most people, January 6th happened for a few hours. But for, but for, all, for those of us who work, were in the thick of it, it has not ended. That they continue to be a constant trauma for us literally every day, whether because our physical or emotional injuries or both. Those officers risk their lives to keep our democracy intact, and they don't want money or medals or glory. They want one thing, accountability. What I ask from you all is to get to the bottom of what happened, and that includes, like, I echo the sentiments of all of the other officers sitting here. I use an analogy to describe what I want as a hitman. If a hitman is hired and he kills somebody, the hitman goes to jail. But not only does the hitman go to jail, but the person who hired them does. There was an attack carried out on January 6th, and a hitman sent them. I want you to get to the bottom of that. All these men want is the truth and the full truth about what happened that day. And we owe them that much. Joining me now, former federal prosecutor and NBC News legal analyst Glenn Kirshner, former U.S. attorney and MSNBC legal analyst Barbara McQuaid, and former spokesperson for the House Oversight Committee and advisor for the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, Kurt Bardella. Glenn, I want to start with you. Despite the Republican gaslighting that we've been living through for the the past several months, this hearing was somewhat of a reset. What are your top takeaways from today? So my top takeaways, Zerlina, is first of all, the testimony of those four police officers who protected everyone in the U.S. Capitol and in a very real sense protected our democracy, their heroism and the heroism of all of the other officers who served that day cannot be overstated. And as somebody who spent a career in law enforcement, it's it's hard to watch that and to to appreciate exactly what happened and what they experienced. I mean, when Harry Dunn talked about how Donald Trump's supporters not only treated him and assaulted him, but the racial epithets they yelled at him in uniform as he was protecting the people in the U.S. Capitol, that moved me to tears. And then I was moved to anger near the end of the hearing when he talked about um, the, the hitman analogy, which he broke down beautifully and eloquently. When somebody orders a hit, not only does the person who carry, carries out the hit go to jail, help be held accountable, the person who ordered the hit, the person who commissioned the crime also needs to be held accountable. The president and the others who spoke and incited that day were the ones who commissioned the crime that these four men testified about today. And I certainly hope that my former colleagues at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office are working their way up the criminal ladder. And, and to that point, Barbara, I think, you know, the, the FBI and federal prosecutors are prosecuting hundreds of defendants for their actions and participation in the insurrection. But in the testimony today, was there anything that came out that's legally relevant for other people that we haven't talked about that did tell those people to go to the Capitol? And, and what types of things should we keep in mind as we listen to the testimony during this hearing to fill in some of the important blanks that we still need to fill in so we know exactly what happened. 
Yes, I think, Zerlina, one of the things that today's testimony uh, really begs is the question of they were so outmanned, and why were they so outmanned? Why was there such a failure yeah. of intelligence when any of us who are members of the public who pay even a little attention to this could have known that there was a great threat of violence that day on January 6th at the Capitol? So uh, I think the committee will want to explore that. I think they'll also want to explore why was there such a substantial delay when it did become apparent they were outmanned and needed help and reinforcements, that it took hours to get the National Guard there. I think they're going to want to know what President Trump was doing before, during, and after this attack. And I also think that uh, one of the things the Justice Department lawyers ought to be looking at um, is the next level of defendants. We've seen people who were there that day have been charged with assault or improper entry. We have seen a level of people charged with conspiracy, like Oath Keepers and other groups, for conspiracy to obstruct an official proceeding. Um, but the thing that I would be looking for is, is there another level above that? Were there people who were organizing this, who were paying for people to be there that day? That's the hitman that Officer Dunn is talking about. It's really, really helpful as we begin these important hearings. And Kurt, I want to play you, I mean, I don't want to play this, but I think it's important for the conversation to add this. Uh, it's a Fox interview with Republican Congressman Jim Banks uh, just moments after the hearing. Let's take a listen. I'll get your reaction on the other side. It's not lost on the American people that every word that comes out of Liz Cheney's mouth or Benny Thompson or anyone who's on this committee has been scripted by Nancy Pelosi to, to, expo to, to talk about her narrative without looking at other narratives along the way, like why was the Capitol vulnerable to begin with? So, as I said, I'm, you know, I don't love playing video of the gyms, um, but I, I do think it's important, Kurt, to understand what the Republican strategy is as we head into these hearings. Is the strategy just to blame Nancy Pelosi and maybe Antifa and hope everybody buys into that, even though we're, what we saw today demonstrates that's not what happened at all on January 6th? Yeah, Zelina, I mean, again, it's the ongoing playbook of distract and distort and to try to misdirect attention away from Donald Trump where it belongs and away from certain Republicans in Congress where it belongs and towards an invisible boogeyman that really had nothing to do with what went wrong on January 6th and Speaker Nancy Pelosi. I mean, Republicans have spent the better part of two decades now spending literally billions of dollars in ads attacking Nancy Pelosi, painting her some sort of left-wing villain that the rest of America should fear. Uh, and it runs completely contrary, of course, to the testimony that we heard today. What Jim Banks is doing is basically t telling the world that the four Capitol and, and Metro PD police officers who appeared today and told their story about what they experienced firsthand, Jim Banks is saying that doesn't matter. Jim Banks is saying that you shouldn't believe them, that you should believe their ongoing commitment to conspiracy theories and lies. And I'll tell you, it was, it was so somber today. And the one thing that I didn't miss was the gyms interrupting and, and yeah. whining and trying to distract away from the proceedings, injecting conspiracy theories into lines of questioning, complaining about how they don't have enough time because uh, of five minutes to get into what they want to get into. Uh, I think today illustrated why Nancy Pelosi was right in ensuring that conspiracy theorists and domestic terrorist sympathizers like Jim Jordan and Jim Banks shouldn't be allowed to be on this committee because these proceedings are too important, too somber, and need to be fact-based and truth-based. And we don't need that type of nonsense. Let them keep going on Fox News and doing their stunts. Let them keep doing what they've been doing for the last four years. The rest of us are going to do the real work and get to the truth. I love that you said that it, it was somber, because I think that that is exactly the tone that I took away from today's hearings, Glenn. And I think that, you know, that's important as we head into uh, probably what's coming up, perhaps some subpoenas and additional witnesses. Liz Cheney has gone as far to suggest that Jim Jordan, Kevin McCarthy, and even Donald Trump be subpoenaed by the committee, which probably will do away with the somber tone. But do you see that any of that happening? And who else do you want to hear from in terms of witnesses that would help fill in the blanks? I would sure like to hear from everybody who has any relevant information about why there was such a failure of response, a failure of intelligence. And let me build on a great point that Barb made about the failures here. Who did we hear from today? We heard from 
uh, officers from only two law enforcement agencies, the Capitol Police, that's a law enforcement agency under the control of Congress, the only one under the control of Congress, and the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, that's a law enforcement agency under the control of the city of the District of Columbia and Mayor Mariel Bowser. Who did we not see? Who did we not have present to defend the Capitol? The countless federal law enforcement agencies available to Donald Trump's executive branch that day. FBI, ATF, DEA, U.S. Marshal Service, Park Police, and the Bureau of Prisons Riot Squad. All of those agencies, Zerlina, took some part in dealing with security issues during the BLM protests. Why was the Capitol deprived of all executive branch law enforcement agencies that could have been deployed, that could have been there to protect the U.S. Capitol that day? Was this a failure or was it an orchestration? That's one of the main questions we need answered. Really important questions. And Barbara, the, Ju the Biden Justice Department has sent a letter uh, to former DOJ officials explaining that it will not block them from testifying in front of this panel, which is a refreshing change from the previous administration's Justice Department. As uh, a former president, could Donald Trump try to block those testimonies by asserting executive privilege? Or do you not have that after you leave? How does that work? Yeah, so this letter is a really important development that the Justice Department has said that these officials may give unrestricted testimony, which is sort of the positive way of saying, don't expect to hide behind executive privilege. Um, I think President Trump could still attempt to assert it. It exists for things that occurred during his presidency, even after his presidency has ended. But I think he'll have an uphill battle now that the Justice Department has come forward and saying that they are not protected by executive privilege because of the extraordinary circumstances of the events involved. I think if he wanted to go to court to assert executive privilege, he would still have the ability to do that. But I think it is greatly diminished by the letter that the Justice Department put out. And I think others will be only too willing to come forward and tell their story. For example, the former U.S. attorney in Atlanta, B.J. Pock, is on that list of people who may now tell their story. He may have previously felt constricted from telling that story. Uh, but now he can come forward and say, what happened? Happened that caused him to resign early uh, as we were seeing that election controversy occurring in Georgia. Yeah, there's so many threads that get lost uh, in the fray here, and it's important that this hearing is sort of resetting everything for us. Glenn Kirshner, Barbara McQuaid, and Kurt Bardella, thank you so much for taking the time out to start the show on this important day in history. Please stay safe. Much more on the January 6th hearing is coming up later in the show, but first, Time to mask up again. As COVID cases climb across the country, the CDC is updating its guidance for vaccinated Americans. We'll be right back. of the world, the Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world, the Tucker Carlson's of the world. I watch them. I listen. I pay attention. They're misinforming people. They're literally putting people's lives at risk. People are dying because of the misinformation, either knowingly or unknowingly. Regardless, time to call it out. Draw these lines. There's been a right-wing talking point here, and it's overwhelmingly coming from certain networks, and it's having an impact on getting this disease behind us. Now it's impacting our economy. It's impacting not just our public health. It's impacting our ability to get our kids into schools. So enough. That was California Governor Gavin Newsom yesterday saying he's had enough. 
He said it's time to name names and call out the people spreading misinformation about COVID and the vaccines. You know, a lot of us can relate to his frustration. Let me tell you, we've talked on this show about having a sense of deja vu with this new COVID wave we're seeing. It's all starting to feel like an endless loop where we're just going back into the dark tunnel over and over, even though we know the way out. And it's fair to wonder, will this ever end? Cases are again rising across the country and hospital ICUs are again filling up. And now the CDC has reversed its position from just two months ago. It is now recommending that even vaccinated people wear masks indoors in areas with high infection rates. But this new COVID wave has some differences from the waves of last spring and summer and the wave during the winter, which you can see here on this graphic on the screen. This time we have vaccines. And this time it seems that more elected officials are publicly calling out people and organizations that are behind the spread of misinformation. President Biden even called out Facebook recently. And you heard the California governor call out certain Republican lawmakers and a certain TV network. That network has just recently changed its tune a little on the vaccines. But here's a small sample of what Fox News viewers have been hearing day in and day out for months. But there are a lot of those people giving you medical advice on television and you should ignore them. The advice they're giving you isn't designed to help, it's designed to make you comply. And what about the efficacy of the vaccine itself among adults? So maybe it doesn't work and they're simply not telling you that. You can see why Governor Gavin Newsom and others are frustrated. I am frustrated watching that clip. And if they're frustrated, just think how it feels to be a doctor or a nurse working in the ICU or on the front lines. Hey, it's Dr. Rob. Just got done with the shift and just had just one of the most frustrating conversations with a patient who was just violently angry with me for trying to get a COVID test. Patient came in with some symptoms that were concerning, had some findings and some imaging that was suggestive of COVID. And I said, hey, we want to get a test. And they just went into a tirade about how hospitals and doctors are making hundreds of thousands of dollars telling people they have COVID. They wouldn't even believe it if I told them they'd have it. Then into the vaccines, how we're giving people COVID with the vaccine and just pissed, just so angry and just took 20 to 30 minutes of my time talking about all of this crap that they're hearing on Fox News and they're seeing on Facebook. You know, it's a pandemic. 600,000 people have died with people being hospitalized and dying now with Delta variant who aren't vaccinated. And this is what I'm spending my time doing. That was Dr. Rob Davison, an ER physician in Western Michigan, who joins me now. He's also the executive director of the group Committee to Protect Healthcare. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks a lot for having me. So, Doctor, lay out for us what led you to post that video um, and, and just let us in on what it's like to to have those conversations and deal with patients who are misinformed about COVID and the vaccines. I mean, you have to talk to them face to face while they're sick in the hospital. I do. And, you know, honestly, I, I stopped by my wife's office. She's a family doctor. She was just getting to work as I was leaving my night shift and I just sort of expressed what had happened. And the frustration she said you know you should just put it on video and put it out there but, you know just a vent and it's a little cathartic for me and, and my colleagues and it's tough right my life my, my my career has been about two decades in a rural conservative community uh doesn't always align with some of my views but I'm, I'm taking care of these people i've been doing it for 20 years they trust me when they come in having chest pain or belly pain or headaches or, or you know with their loved ones and i've held hands with these people and i've hugged these people and prayed with these people over their loved ones and then you know because of the politicization and this the crap they're hearing on fox and others people are now accusing me of trying to hurt them or of trying to just profit off of them and lie to them. And, and this isn't the first time, this is one of the most egregious and it was at the end of a night shift and, and you know, I stayed over past my shift. And so there are a lot of factors in there that just made me kind of, kind of lose it a bit on that video. Uh, but it's, it's yeah. just unbelievable. We're just trying to help them. Um, and I wish that they would accept our help. Were you able to convince that patient to take the COVID test? 
No, no. Uh, she just decided. I said, well, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm suspicious you may have it and you should go home and isolate. And I said, I can't make you do that. I can't go home with you. And, uh, I, you know, I hope that you can learn to trust that we're just here trying to take care of you. And, and you know, the person left. And so um, I've had other conversations where people express doubt, where they tell me, well, I'm afraid of what's in the vaccines. I asked them, well, what, what is in it that you're afraid of? They said, well, I don't really know what's in it. So it's coming from different angles. This was certainly one of the more violent <laughs> ones, or at least not violent, but just very angry and, and, and kind of screaming tirades at me about all of these conspiracies that we've been hearing since day one. The former president you know, was uh, perpetrating a lot of this about doctors trying to get rich off of diagnosing COVID. And, you know, Again, we're just mm -hmm. trying to do what's best for our patients. And it's really tough having Fox and some politicians and others get in our way and poison the minds of these folks. One of the things I, I wonder is if it's worse now than it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and you seem like a really good person to ask, considering you are front patient facing uh, in terms of you're interacting with people at the beginning when we were dealing with the original variant and now dealing with the Delta variant. Is there any change in the attitudes? Are they hardened against the vaccine and thinking uh, the way that they're being told on Fox News or has that evolved over time? I think it's worse now, and I think maybe it's worse because we all, and I remember we had a big wave here in March in Michigan, and our hospital was full, and our region was full, and paramedics were leaving the field of, of doing that job because they were just work to the bone, driving people around, you know, all of West Michigan, trying to find a hospital bed for patients. And so once we came out of that wave, and vaccines were coming, and people were getting vaccinated, I remember talking, having ridiculous conversations, now that I look back on it, with my colleagues saying, this may be it, like, we're going to get out of this. You know, we had hope. We had all been vaccinated. We expected mm -hmm. that people would eventually come around and get vaccinated. And now I'm still working in a county that has about a 40% vaccination rate. And it feels like, you know, we're not out of it. And, you know, you see down south in states that have very low rates, just Delta ripping through these places. And it's just so preventable. And I think that's why it makes it so much harder. You know, perhaps the attitudes are similar, but the situation is so much different. It's hard not to get frustrated and not to get, you know, angry with the people feeding them disinformation day in and day out. So, so that's a good uh, question that I have as well. Are you most angry in that moment when you're talking to your patient at Tucker Carlson and the Laura Ingrahams of the world, or are you just frustrated with COVID and, and, and just generally the fact that this pandemic has sort of spun out of control a little bit? Because like you, I thought that once we got this vaccine, we were gonna be headed you know, back to some sort of normal. And now it seems like we are firmly planted in the dark tunnel of this pandemic. Without a doubt, I am frustrated with the people who are perpetuating the lies. And, you know, Tucker Carlson and Laura Ingram at the top of the list. We've had a few about faces and we've had Fox as a network come out with some PSAs. And that's great. I mean, I welcome that. Um, it's very little. It's very late. And, and I hope that by fall, by winter, that has an impact on what we might see then. Because, listen, it's summer. People are outside. You know, what, do we, what happens when everyone starts going back inside again? and they're still not vaccinated in Delta or the next one. I don't know the Greek alphabet in its entirety, but I'm afraid we're going to run out of letters because they just keep right. kind of popping this, you know, this, this thing's going to spin out of control. So, yeah, I'm frustrated with the pandemic only because these people are making it harder. You know, we could be doing a lot better, and unfortunately we're not, and they're a big reason behind that. So one of the things that happened today is the CDC, I think a lot of people predicted this, but they changed their, their guidance for vaccinated people and are saying mask indoors, uh, in, especially in COVID hotspots. I mean, one of the things that I've always thought about since the beginning is doctors and nurses, they're on the front lines. They're dealing with COVID patients every single day. How are they making sure that they go home um, in most cases without contracting COVID? They are wearing masks. They are wearing gloves. They are wearing shields. They are wearing protective equipment. Um, do you hope that maybe with this wave, the public will see the CDC's change in the guidance and, and abide by it? And that, you know, that masking indoors, especially because we're about to get into fall, is so critically important right now. I do. I mean, I was like a lot of people. I've been doing this for a couple of weeks now because of Delta and because of the low vaccine mm -hmm. 
vaccination rate around me. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm ever hopeful, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm somewhat uh, uh, dubious in, in knowing the folks that aren't getting vaccinated are the same folks that didn't want masks, or the same folks that don't want their kids to have to mask in school. I went to a, a school board meeting a week ago and, and saw dozens of people getting up and basically saying, we're tired of COVID and we don't want to do anything about it. And unfortunately, being an ostrich and sticking our heads in the sand is just it's just going to rip through just as much or even worse. So, uh, yeah, you know, I'll keep telling my patients and encouraging my loved ones and, 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 and others. And hopefully people in your audience will, will abide by some of these guidelines, because I do think um, it's going to help us as a community, as a country. But it's going to help people not die and that, you know, they should be selfish about it and do this for themselves. I know. I, I'm like, how? Why are we having such a hard time convincing people to help themselves to live? I never thought we would it's see crazy. the day where that's a hard sell. Um, but Dr. Rob Davison, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us today, and and thank you for posting that video. It was incredibly important for people to see that honesty. Please stay safe. Before we go to break, former Auburn football coach turned U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville has some explaining to do about some very questionable stock trades. The Alabama Republican broke a financial transparency law by failing to disclose the trades within a 45-day window required by the Stock Act. And these were some big-time trades. Like, this isn't something he was doing on Robin Hood. Uh, they range from about 900000 to $3.5 million in total. That is not the amount of money that I have. I, this is crazy. Some of them were in companies that have appeared before the Armed Services Committee, which Tuberville sits on. Tuberville has also been a strong critic of China and has praised an executive order by President Biden targeting U.S. investments in Chinese companies. But as a candidate for Senate, he was selling stock options of Chinese e-commerce company Alibaba. In response, Tuberville is pleading ignorance, of course. A spokesperson for the senator told CNBC that he was unaware of the trades and that they were conducted by financial advisors. So at home, you might be thinking, what is the punishment for this? This feels uneth unethical. There's got to be some huge fine or, I don't know, suspension, right? Turns out, no, no, there's n no. He might have to cough up 200 bucks. That's, that's his punishment. You heard that right. I know there's a lot on Congress's plate right now, but it feels like we might need to tighten up the rules surrounding activities like this because that's part of the reason why it's all broken. But I'm not going to hold my breath. We need to elect different people. Coming up, much more on the opening hearing by the January 6th committee. Congresswoman Johanna Hayes hid with her 12-year-old son inside the Capitol that day, and she joins me next. Long after you are gone, you will be remembered as heroes to our country, along with your fellow officers and those who attacked you and those who beat you are fascist traitors to our country and will be remembered forever as fascist traitors.
What makes the struggle harder and more painful is to know so many of my fellow citizens, including so many of the people I put my life at risk to defend, are downplaying or outright denying what happened. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. Today we saw a very rare thing. We saw a congressional hearing in which the witnesses were people who risked their lives to defend the members of Congress doing the questioning. One of those witnesses, Officer Daniel Hodges, talked about what it was like when he was pinned in a doorway trying to block the insurrectionists from entering a tunnel in the heart of the Capitol on January 6th. And Congresswoman Stephanie Murphy took a moment to say thank you. This is will please rise and raise their right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Trump. Sergeant Gunnell and Officer Hodges, you, you, you both said that you didn't realize that other parts of the Capitol had been breached, but you really felt like you were the last line of defense. Well, I'm telling you that you were our last line of defense. Um, and during the exact period of time, Officer Hodges, in that video where you were sacrificing your body to hold that door, it gave uh, Congresswoman Rice and I and the Capitol Police officers who had been sent to extract us the freedom of movement on that hallway to escape down the other end of that hallway. And I, I shudder to think about what would have happened had you not held that line. You know, I, I have two young children. I have a 10-year-old son and a 7-year-old daughter. And they're the light of my life. And the reason I was able to hug them again was because of the courage that you and your fellow officers showed that day. And so just a really heartfelt thank you. Joining me now is Congresswoman Johanna Hayes. During the insurrection, she hid with her 12-year-old son inside her Capitol Hill office. Congresswoman, Thank, first of all, thank you so much for being here. It was incredibly uh, emotional to watch that testimony today. You're absolutely right. Thank you for having me. And I actually went down to, to the committee room because I wanted to be there when the officers delivered their testimony to support them. But I had no idea how raw it would be for me to relive those images and to hear what they were saying. And like Congresswoman Murphy, I was looking at January 6th through the eyes of my son, who was on this campus in this very office, hearing all of those sounds. And it, it was palpable in that room today. Yeah, I came across through the television. Uh, what did you take away in terms of the testimony? Um, and what are the important things that you're listening out for as we go into uh, these hearings and this investigation? There were so many points in this testimony that were so incredibly powerful. Officer Ganell made a statement where he said, every member of Congress made it home safely. We did our jobs. And that was piercing for me because all they're asking is for us to do our job. Um, this is not partisan. They made it very clear over and over and over again. There's an expectation amongst these officers to gather the information and use that information to close those security gaps to make sure that this never happens again. Every single one of them unequivocally said, what we are looking for is for Congress to not only hold those accountable, for how this happened, but also to address it so that it never happens again. We have a responsibility. We need to, we have some serious security breaches that were identified and we have the ability to fix those things. Three months ago, we voted for a security supplemental that has not moved in the Senate yet. I'm hearing that there has been some movement today and a deal may have been reached, but there should be a sense of urgency on this. I was embarrassed today. I was embarrassed sitting there listening to these officers who, Basically, it, it felt like they were the ones on trial. They were trying to convince 
the general public that that we need help, that this really happened, and I need you to to acknowledge it and address it. That should be a non-starter. So as a member of Congress today, as I walk back to my office, my head was down. And every officer I encountered, I encountered, I was like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that this is even happening. I'm sorry that you have to relive this. And not just the officers. I had a young staffer with me that day in my office who has no family in DC, mm -hmm. who her only connection to this, state, to this city is her job in my office. She picked up from Connecticut and moved here. And a 20 something year old woman new in her career should not have to worry about going to work and not making it home or not feeling safe on this campus. I feel responsible for her and there's more we can do. Absolutely, and when you talk about the more that we can do, you mentioned that there's a security gap. In terms of that gap, what do you see as some of the most important things that uh, both need to be uncovered through the, these hearings, but also sort of a to-do list of, of items so that this doesn't happen again? Because that's the question for me that looms largest, is how do we prevent this from happening again if we don't hold the people accountable who did it the first time? Well, first of all, the Capitol Police should be fully staffed. Their equipment, many of them said that it was faulty. They hadn't used it, it hadn't been tested, and when they pulled it out, uh, it was faulty. There was no backup. I remember standing by the window for hours saying, why isn't anyone coming? My husband's a police officer, has been on the job for 25 years. I've seen rapid responses. I've seen when they've had to call out in outside forces and units. I've seen all of that. We're hearing now that the National Guard has not been paid, that um, things that we know, just basic things that are not partisan, don't involve politics. Um, some of our, our safety checkpoints all need to be addressed. Everybody's talking about we want this campus open. We want to be able to gather and walk freely on this campus. But how can we do that when we are leaving these officers so vulnerable? And they said in this hearing today, I would do it again. I protected these members before right. January 6th. I see these same officers. I see Officer Dunn all the time on campus. So they continue to protect us. But he said, I would do it again. Even officers who are refusing to, I mean, members who are refusing to acknowledge that this happened, members who are refusing to shake the hands of Capitol Police, these officers said, mm. I would still protect them because that's the oath I swore to. It, that is so, so poignant. Um, how is your son doing? Uh, that living through January 6th um, is, a, is a traumatic event. Is, is he doing okay? It's interesting because before January 6th, our children get uh, an ID badge, which identifies them as members. And he was so proud to put that badge on and come up to the campus and wander on his own because Capitol Police would direct him back. He could never leave the building but he'd go and take pictures with his phone. And now on the occasion when he is in DC with me, he's very hesitant to come to my office. He doesn't wanna leave the office without me. It's just a very different atmosphere. So the safety and security of this campus that he's always known is gone. I mean, we, I, I sought counseling for my son immediately after. And you know, as any 12 year old, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, but I'm worried about the residual effects of this. I want him to think of this, the nation's capital of Washington, DC, of his mom's workplace, of Congress as a whole, as a place that is safe. And I think that they, that may have been shattered for him on January 6th. But, but I also know that we have the opportunity as members of Congress to redirect that narrative, to change the outcome so that my son and Stephanie's children, I'm sorry, Congresswoman Murphy's children, and all of the other young people that watched what happened here would know that, as Representative Kinzinger said, it's how we respond after crises that defines a democracy. So that my son knows that, no, 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 bad things happen. But your mom and her colleagues stood up to make sure that that never happens mm -hmm. again. I'm sorry, I didn't realize how Absolutely. raw this would be so today. But that in that room, no, I you could hear a pin drop in there. And 
I, my heart ached for those officers. No, I, I, I understand and I, and I empathize so deeply because, you know, when you experience something traumatic, it comes up and, you know, at the most unexpected moments. Um, and so I am so grateful to you, Congresswoman, for taking the time today and for talking about uh, your experience and your son's experience. And I wish you the best. I hope um, that he is, I mean, he sounds strong and smart, so I'm sure he will be great because his mom is great. But, you know, thank you for taking the time and for sharing uh, the stories with us from that day. It's so important, these hearings. Please stay safe. Before we go to break, another moment of Olympic joy, and it happened right here in the USA. It comes by the way of 17-year-old Lydia Jacoby. She made history by winning the gold medal in the 100-meter breaststroke Tuesday morning. Jacoby wasn't just the first Alaskan to win gold in the Olympic pool. She was the very first Olympic swimmer to ever come from Alaska. Her hometown of Seward, Alaska is really, really small. It's tiny with a population of less than 3,000 people. That's like my high school's bigger. While they don't have strength in numbers, those people know how to get hype. Take a look at the watch party as Lydia grabbed the gold. They pay particularly attention to the boys in the front. I want every one of my friends and family, that's how you need to be cheering for me, okay? My best friend sent me to this and it's like, that's how I cheer for you. Now, those are some excited Alaskans. And I just want to say congratulations to Lydia. You made your hometown so very proud. Coming up, a shocker at the Olympics. Simone Biles remains the GOAT. Don't at me for choosing herself over expectations. And I'm proud of her. We'll be right back. It's been really stressful, this Olympic Games, I think, just as a whole, um, not having an audience. There are a lot of different variables going into it. It's been a long week. It's been a long Olympic process. It's been a long year. Um, so just a lot of different variables, and I think we're just a little bit too stressed out. Um, but we should be out here having fun, and sometimes that's not the case. Today, Simone Biles made a choice. She chose to pull out of the USA Team Gymnastics Final. It was a breaking news event on almost every major news channel. But what we haven't talked enough about is why. She wasn't physically hurt, so why did she do it? And it turns out that it was an important step in her mental health journey. When it comes to gymnastics, Simone Biles is the GOAT. Do not debate me on that, period, with a T. But I can see how that's a lot of pressure to live up to every single day. So when she took to the vault this morning, she didn't, she said she wasn't feeling, doing the event for herself. She was doing it because of everyone else watching and the pressure, it, it was just too much. She went on to say, at the end of the day, we're human too. So we have to protect our mind and our body rather than just go out there and do what the world wants us to do with the year that it's been, I'm really not surprised how it played out. And joining me now, I am really excited to say, our former Olympic gymnast, gold medalist, Carly Patterson. 
She won three medals at the Athens Olympic Games in 2004. And former UCLA gymnast Caitlin Ohashi, two years ago, she wrote an op-ed for NBC about mental health in the sport titled, How Walking Away from Elite Gymnastics Helped Me Reclaim My Joy. And I am so grateful to both of you for taking the time. Carly, I'm going to start with you. As an Olympian yourself, what are some of the pressures that come with being an elite gymnast at this level and training for an Olympic Games? And talk about just the weight that you have to carry as you go and compete on the Olympic stage. Yeah, it is the most pressure-filled situation that you will ever find yourself in, no doubt. You know, the Olympics being every four years, it creates just this, this pressure that builds and builds and builds. And not only are you, you know, dealing with the pressure of competing at the Olympics, but you have to have all these factors kind of play out and work together in sync um, at the same time. So you have to peak at the right time. You have to be mentally prepared, physically prepared, and ready to go at this one moment in every four years. And it is a lot, a lot of pressure. And I remember just, you know, thinking you have your one shot to to make your entire life's dreams and goals happen on one night. And you have millions of people watching you. Um, the expectations of not only yourself and the hard work that you've put in through the years, but the expectations of the world and your country that you're doing it for as well. Um, it is just, it's hard to explain. There are just so many factors that go into creating such a pressure-filled moment like the Olympic Games. When you first heard it, uh, the news, like when it was the push notification came on your phone, Carly, what was your first reaction? Were you like, oh, my God, what is <laughs> happening? Because I obviously it was confusing in the moment. But also, you know, I, I was kind of like, oh, she's saying I am not it's not going to be safe if I do this. I'm pulling out. And I was like, respect. Yeah. You know, I was actually nursing my baby at the moment. I was about to turn everything on. And my husband yelled at me from his, um, from his office. He was like, Simone's out. Simone got hurt. Like whatever. And I was like, what, what, you know, freaking out. Like, yeah, I couldn't believe it. I, I would have bet, you know, my house, probably everything I had that, um, a scenario like this would, we would have not heard of, you know? So it's just, it was absolutely shocking, which I think is why you know we are seeing this everywhere and we're all here right now talking about it um, because it's just something that you wouldn't have thought. I think we forget that we are all human and, and someone like Simone is human and she's showing that. And it's one of those things where you, you've built this person up in your mind. And even I've been guilty of that with her. I'm like, gosh, she is such a machine. She can't, mm -hmm. she can't make a mistake. She can't get hurt. Right. She can't like, she is perfect. And so to see her be human like this has been like, wow, like you forget that. Like, oh my goodness. Like, yeah, good for her for just being human <laughs> and showing everybody that she is human. And Hey, like take some of this pressure off me. People just Oh, step back, you know. Right, right. And Caitlin, you have you have talked about this um, in in your own career as an elite gymnast. Um, when you got injured and stepped away from the sport, you talked about the fact that you weren't having fun. You were not having fun doing the sport of gymnastics, um, and the it's the culture of gymnastics, uh, the way coaches are traditionally. This is the first Olympics post Larry Nasser. We have to just say that this is. Um, you know, a big shift in USA Gymnastics towards, you know, maybe creating a sport that is healthier for the, the mental and physical well-being of gymnasts. What was your reaction when you saw the news today? Did you think about um, your own battles with, you know, mental and physical health and well-being, you know, and, and grappling with all of that as you, you know, try to find the love for the sport of gymnastics? Because I love, I love gymnastics, but, it, you know, it's complicated. Yeah, well, it's funny because I remember watching trials and, you know, when I stepped away from elite gymnastics, I kind of stepped away completely and hadn't watched it for a while. And you hear all the news, like a lot of stuff has been changing in elite gymnastics and you just hope for the best. And I remember watching trials and I, I texted my old coach, Miss Bow, and I was just like, ah, oh, it's so sad. Still no one smiles and it looks like no one's doing it for themselves. Mm. And so when I, you know, I, I'm out here in Manchester right now. Uh, broadcasting with BBC and we're sitting there watching and we're like, wait a minute, she's not with the team anymore. What's happening? And then 
you start thinking about it and you're like, I mean, it's not shocking. Just the other day she posted about the pressure and she's been in the eyes of the mm-hmm. public. Millions and billions of people have been watching her since 2013, which she hasn't lost a competition since then. And it is, I mean, it's so much pressure and people expected her to carry the team single-handedly to victory this year. So, and she's also had 19 months off. She just came back in April. There is a lot going on. And I think the pandemic sitting there reflecting on everything she has, I think has only made her realize and come to this conclusion that she's not doing it for herself. And there is a lot of pressure and she needed to do this for herself. I think that's that's so true. I mean, think about the year we've had, just everyone, not just these elite athletes. Um, and Caitlin, Simone's sister tweeted, y'all are all about mental health until it no longer benefits you. You know, why do you think it's so important for athletes and role models like Simone and Naomi Osaka recently to be open about mental health struggles? I think it removes some of that stigma, right? Well, especially with athletes, because a lot of, a lot of, People, I mean, you hear the slogan more than an athlete and so many people want to discount that and they're like, oh, just shut up and play your sport. Right. But when another thing with mental health and social media is I feel like almost mental health journeys are glamorized. And for the first time, this is kind of in your face. We witnessed it on a global level. It was all broadcasted exactly what she's going through. She didn't perform to the best of her abilities this this competition. and you know, today was just in your face. We need to prioritize the athlete. It's so, so critically important. Um, and Carly, you during your elite career, I think you were actually um, the first, I believe, um, to win that Olympic gold medal. And in, in a lot of ways, you, you were at the forefront of sort of this era where, you know, it's all about the goal. You know, every team has a nickname, <laughs> the Fierce Five, the Fab Five, the Mag- Magnificent Seven. And I feel like, you know, all of that winning, it came at a cost. Um, when I think about, um, you know, all that happened with Larry Nassar or, or even, you know, to Caitlin's point, trying to shift the sport in terms of caring about the whole athlete, you know, that's a new thing in this sport. Can you just reflect on, um, you know, your own personal journey as in trying to have a healthy relationship with gymnastics and whether you think, you know, that's really taking hold in the sport, you know, with Simone and others speaking and speaking their truth? Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we haven't all had the same exact journey, right? So I am completely blessed. And I have said, um, you know, in the last four years, five years, since all of the Larry Nassar stuff came out, like I am, I count myself lucky to have not been abused by him. And I worked with him for five years. Um, you know, and I count myself blessed that I had a coach that I had a true, real, genuine relationship with. I literally talked to him this morning today and I can go to him. He's Mm -hmm. still my mentor. He's like my second dad. And so I was able to have more of a positive experience than a lot of these people. And like I said, I count myself very blessed and very lucky because of that. But yeah, there have been so many things that needed to needed to change and still need to change. And the pressures that these girls are feeling like they really need to be, like Caitlin said, prioritized and just heard and, yeah. you know, continue to have fun. Like I was seeing, I'm starting to see the glimpses of the girls having fun again. And that has been such right. a joy for me to watch. And I just hope it continues. Me too. Carly Patterson and Caitlin Ohashi, thank you so much for this really thoughtful and, and important conversation. You can watch live Olympic coverage uh, on Peacock every morning. That does it for me. Mehdi Hassan is coming up next.
Tonight, four police officers testify in gritty detail about the physical and emotional abuse they endured defending the Capitol from pro-Trump insurrectionists and from everyone who's since tried to deny what happened that day. Too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. Ahead, the emotional testimony and what happens next with Congressman Seth Moulton, who was there that day. And I'll also talk to the man who led the security task force after the January 6th Capitol attack, General Russell Honore. Plus the devastating new report that accuses Israel of committing apparent war crimes against civilians in Gaza. Those details ahead. And the fight over not just who gets to vote, but who counts the votes. Are Georgia's Republicans laying the groundwork for a state takeover of elections in Atlanta's liberal-leaning Fulton County? Good evening, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Who hired the Capitol riot hitman? That was the message from one officer who testified today at the first hearing of the January 6th Select Committee. If a hitman is hired and he kills somebody, the hitman goes to jail. But not only does the hitman go to jail, but the person who hired them does. There was an attack carried out on January 6th and a hitman sent them. I want you to get to the bottom of that. It was a gut-wrenching day, and we want to warn you, some of what you're about to hear is violent, is racist, is disturbing. But across the Capitol, police officers were spellbound, watching the proceedings on TVs and on their cell phones in the hallways of Congress, while four of their colleagues described what happened to them when they fought back against the mob that descended on the Capitol building. When I received the text message, it, 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 it made the hairs on my neck rise. They were scared. Um, they were, you know, clearly outnumbered and being violently assaulted. More and more insurrectionists were pouring into the area by the speaker's lobby near the rotunda, and some wearing MAGA hats and shirts that said Trump 2020. MPD had discovered a bomb of some type near the Capitol. This thought was never far from my mind for the rest of the day. A baseball bat, a hockey stick, a rebar, a flagpole, um, including the American flag. Essentially an infinite number of replacements. They'd say, you know, we need fresh patriots up here, and there would be more. They were calling us traitors, even though they were the one doing, committing the treasonous act. One man tried and failed to build a rapport with me, shouting, are you my brother? Another takes a different tack, shouting, you will die on your knees. Riders immediately began to pull me by my leg, by my shield, by my gear strap on my left shoulder. My survivor's instincts kicked in and I started kicking and punching. He kicked me in my chest as we went to the ground. I was able to retain my baton again, but I ended up on my hands and knees and blind. The medical mask I was wearing at the time to protect myself from the coronavirus was pulled up over my eyes so I couldn't see. I braced myself against the impact of their blows and feared the worst. At some point during the fighting, I was dragged from the line of officers and into the crowd. I heard someone scream. I got one. As I was swarmed by a violent mob, they ripped off my badge. They grabbed and stripped me of my radio. They seized ammunition that was secured to my body. They began to beat me with their fists and with what felt like hard metal objects. I heard chanting from some in the crowd, get his gun and kill him with his own gun. I was electrocuted again and again and again with a taser. During those moments, I remember thinking there was a very good chance I would be torn apart or shot to death with my own weapon. I thought of my four daughters who might lose their dad. In my most vulnerable moments, um, the, uh, the man in front of me took, uh, took advantage um, and beat me, you know, beat me in the head, ripped off my gas mask, straining my neck, skull, um, split my lip open, um, just everything he could. I could feel my, myself losing oxygen and recall thinking to myself, 
this is how I'm going to die defending this entrance. Doctors told me that I had suffered a heart attack and I was later diagnosed with a concussion, a traumatic brain injury, and post-traumatic stress disorder. As four officers, we would do January 6th all over again. We wouldn't stay home because we knew it was gonna happen. We would show up, that's courageous, that's heroic. So what I ask from you all is to get to the bottom of what happened. Just as a reminder, these were the actions of the same people that GOP Senator Ron Johnson once said, truly respect law enforcement, would never do anything to break the law. Hmm. Officer Michael Fanon today called out lawmakers who've been downplaying what happened at the Capitol. I feel like I went to hell and back to protect them and the people in this room. But too many are now telling me that hell doesn't exist or that hell actually wasn't that bad. The indifference shown to my colleagues is disgraceful. Nothing, truly nothing, has prepared me to address those elected members of our government who continue to deny the events of that day. And in doing so, betray their oath of office. But the mob that came down on the Capitol wasn't just violent, it was racist. Capitol Police Officer Harry Dunn said racial epithets were hurled at him and other black officers during that attack. Here's some of that testimony, which, to warn you, does include the racial slur he says he endured. I told them to just leave the Capitol, and in response they yelled, no man, this is our house. President Trump invited us here. We're here to stop the steal. Joe Biden is not the president. Nobody voted for Joe Biden. I responded, well, I voted for Joe Biden. Does my vote not count? Am I nobody? <sighs> that prompted a torrent of racial epithets. One woman in a pink MAGA shirt yelled, you hear that, guys? This nigger voted for Joe Biden. <sighs> then the crowd, perhaps around 20 people, joined in screaming, boo, fucking nigger. No one had ever, ever called me a nigger while wearing the uniform of a Capitol Police officer. Another reminder, this is the same slur-slinging crowd that Donald Trump says was loving and hugging and kissing officers on January the 6th. It wasn't just these police officers who became emotional. Committee members themselves also shed tears during the hearing today, including Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger. You guys may like individually feel a little broken. You guys all talk about the effects you have to deal with and you know, you talk about the impact of that day. But you guys won. You guys held. You know, democracies, are not defined by our bad days. We're defined by how we come back from bad, de bad days, how we take accountability for that. Kinzinger and Liz Cheney are the only two GOP members on the committee, both appointed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Both slammed their party for refusing to participate in the investigation and dismissing it as a partisan fight. Cheney said the committee may call Congressman Jim Jordan from the GOP as a material witness and it could subpoena House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy and potentially even former President Donald Trump himself. And now we're learning the Justice Department has cleared the way for former Trump officials to testify about efforts to overturn the election. Kinzinger today called his party's treatment of the January 6th committee toxic, but that may be an understatement. Here's what GOP leadership was saying today before the hearing. It is a fact that the U.S. Capitol Police raised concerns, and rather than providing them with the support and resources they needed and they deserved, she prioritized her partisan political optics over their safety. The American people deserve to know the truth that Nancy Pelosi bears responsibility as Speaker of the House for the tragedy that occurred on January 6th. When you lie as brazenly as that, is it difficult to sleep at night, I wonder? 
Since January, Republicans have been trying to shift blame onto Nancy Pelosi, claiming she blocked National Guard troops from going to the Capitol. But that's been fact-checked many times now. The Speaker does not control or direct the National Guard, nor is she typically involved in the day-to-day -day decisions about security protocols. To try and blame Pelosi for 1-6 is a 9-11 truther-style conspiracy theory. It's mad. But talking of what's mad and talking of conspiracy theories, also today, some of Donald Trump's most fervent right-wing supporters in the House of Representatives were at the DOJ, demanding answers over the treatment of people they call January 6th prisoners. Not rioters, not insurrectionists, not terrorists, as one police officer referred to them as today, but prisoners, as in political prisoners. But the officers who those prisoners attacked made it very clear in their testimony today about what it is they want to happen now. I need you guys to address if anyone in power had a role in this. And also whether or not there was collaboration between those members, their staff, and these terrorists. We can't do it. We're not allowed to. Joining me now are retired Army Lieutenant General Russell Honore, who conducted the Capitol Security Review in the wake of the January 6th riot, and NBC News senior reporter Ben Collins, who covers the disinformation beat. Thank you both for joining me on the show this evening. Uh, General Honore, let me start with you. What was your reaction to today's testimony, especially Officer Dunn's description of the disgusting racism that he faced while in uniform on January the 6th? Well, I think those officers, uh, I will always be behind them. They did a superb testimony today, very compelling. And what I walked away with is that the mega crowd that mobbed that President Trump sent to the Capitol uh, were not only terrorists in their attempts to overthrow the government, they're a bunch of racists. Uh, and I'm lost for words with the amount of racial hatred that was shown toward our officers and is indicative of what this crowd was. They were terrorists and they were white nationalist racists and they had Trump on their name, on their head and on their clothes. So that tells me a lot about yes. this mega crowd that they are white nationalists as well as terrorists. Yes, pretty stark. Uh, ben, six days after the attack on the Capitol, while Trump was defending his rhetoric at the rally, uh, you predicted in six months there will be a part of pro-Trump media that becomes full 1-6 truthers. Denial of history is inevitable. We just heard Representative Elise Stefanik try to put the blame on Pelosi for 1-6. I wonder, are the people who need convic convincing, who need to see and hear the truth about 1-6, are they even watching these hearings? No, absolutely not. They're, you know, if they're watching OAN, they heard Matt Gates today and they heard at least Stefanik, but they did not actually hear this hearing. Um, and that is generally true of the MAGA ecosystem. Now, you know, when I tweeted that six months ago, I didn't think it would be this bad. Um, there seems to be several different tracks you can take. It's choose your own adventure to evade reality. That's what's going on with this party right now, um, except for Adam Kinzinger and, and, uh, and Liz Cheney. Now, the Choose Your Own Adventure includes things like uh, the DOJ has secret incriminating evidence that proves that the FBI was up to this. That's what Representative Gosar has been saying recently. That's just full InfoWars stuff. But that moves the Overton window to the point where the moderate position is, yeah, this happened, but it wasn't that bad. And it was that bad. That's what yeah. we learned today. One of, the, one of the officers today said something that struck me, which was, what did they think was going to happen? They were going to get in there and you know, not kidnap someone, not kill someone, because that's what he knew was going to happen if they breached this line, if they got to these lawmakers. What if they got to Nancy Pelosi? What if they got to AOC, who are these comic book villains in their universe? Do you think they were just going to look at them yeah. and let them go? Absolutely not. There was a clip in the video today, which we didn't play. It's awful, where one of the insurrectionists picks up a phone inside the building and hurls... Uh, horrible epithets that he imagines he's speaking to Nancy Pelosi. Yeah, there was no way that Pelosi, AOC and others, and Mike Pence, 
uh, were not at risk that day. No way. Uh, General Honoré, the Department of Justice today cleared the way for Trump officials to be subpoenaed, and the Biden administration waived executive privilege. You said today on MSNBC earlier that the Trump White House was, quote, complicit in the planning and that delayed response on January the 6th. How likely do you think it is that former Trump officials, the people around Trump, that Trump himself will testify? And what do we need to learn from them? You know, I'm not quite sure all the legal maneuvering that uh, former President Trump will use, which he'll use uh, every angle of the law to prevent himself from testifying. But we all saw what happened. We saw the man give a speech telling people to go to the Capitol and hold on and fight for what you want. All of the middle words, the dog whistling to incite people to uh, be violent. We watched it. Then we watched him watching the event unfold like he was watching a soccer match, like he was pulling for his people to break in. Here's a man that controlled the nuclear weapons of the United States that day and two million people in uniform. And he is yeah. making a mockery of our democracy. And I think he was complicit. He and his entire staff up there are complicit. And there could be members in certain agencies of the government that was complicit. There's no way in hell we didn't know that. We know when every foreign president in the world wake up and where they're going that day. How in the hell we didn't know a bunch of mega followers weren't going to attack the Capitol. There's a big lie yeah. on that part. And that need to be cleared up. And hopefully this committee will get to the bottom. Who knew it does. what, where. They are complicit. It, it does need to be cleared up. And complicity is a real... Uh... <laughs> It's a big word and it's a real issue and there's a lot of prima facie evidence for it, sadly. Uh, ben, Liz Cheney asked one of the officers today how he felt about statements from Trump calling the riots a loving crowd, a love fest, who are hugging and kissing uh, the officers who were there. Here's what that police officer, Officer Gunnell, said. It's a pathetic excuse for his behavior for something that he himself helped to create, this monstrosity. I'm still recovering from those hugs and kisses. If that was hugs and kisses, then we should all go to his house and do the same thing to him. Ben, this is your beat misinformation. Is there an effective way to combat some of the counter narratives and misinformation emanating from the right on 1-6 that continue to spread despite the testimonies we saw today and the videos we saw today? There is there is a group of people that are never going to be reached now because of how siloed off this is. It's part of how authoritarians work and fascist governments work. Um, you know, they create their own worlds and they tell everyone that, you know, m information, real factual information cannot penetrate it and should not be trusted. The best thing that we can do is, as a society is figure out what happened on January 6th and figure out what happened in the weeks before it. Um, that's something we don't know. We simply do not know other than third-hand accounts, we're seven months into this thing. We don't know, other than third-hand accounts, what the president was doing that day, what he was thinking, what he was saying, and, you know, who made decisions that day. Charles Flynn, who is Mike Flynn's brother, appeared to have been making decisions on January 6th. We don't know anything about this. We we still have no idea how involved he was, but we do know when, yes. when the army was asked about it first, they lied. They said he wasn't involved in any decision-making, and then they later came back and they said he did. So what we know so far is lies, obfuscation, and people dancing around the truth about this. The best way to fight this is to get real yes. information, first and foremost. And then, you know, once we hear from them, we can get people, uh, we can try to get that to the other side and just say, hey, this is what actually happened. Um, yes. Most people will come to the truth. In a sense, today was the emotional day, but it was also the kind of easy day. From now, it gets much harder, digging into some of those questions that you and the general raised uh, so far in this discussion. We'll have to leave it there. Lieutenant General Russell Honoré and NBC reporter Ben Collins, thank you both so much for your time, for your analysis. Appreciate it. There was a split-screen quality to today's proceedings. On the one hand, there was what was happening inside the chamber, laying out how close we were to an even bigger disaster. But across town, some of... Some of their colleagues, if you can call them that, Republican colleagues of the committee members were focused on the welfare of the people who assaulted the Capitol. The officers, the police officers who are still recovering from their physical injuries, explained the mental toll it is taking on their service and on the force. 
You're talking about people who claim that they are pro-law enforcement, pro-police, pro-law and order. And then yet when they have the chance and the opportunity to do something about it, to hold people accountable, you don't. You pass the bucket like nothing happened. And, and it's so devastating for recruiting. Joining me now is Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. He, of course, was in the Capitol on January the 6th and called it a direct assault from President Trump that day. Congressman, thanks for coming back on the show. Officer Harry Dunn talked today about not just jailing the hitman, but the person who hired the hitman. In this case, for the purposes of this analogy, is that person Donald J. Trump? And yet he's not facing any consequences for 1-6. Well, he's not facing any consequences yet because we truly haven't gotten to the bottom of exactly what, what went on that day and who inspired these insurrectionists to try to take down our democracy. And that's why this committee is so important. That's why this investigation is so important. And it's why Americans, no matter what side of the political aisle you're on or whether you don't care about politics at all, we all should be invested in getting the results here and finding the truth with what went on. Yes, indeed. And the Department of Justice approved uh, former Trump officials uh, to be questioned by the House and Senate. Should they, in your view, should this committee subpoena former Trump officials, Donald Trump himself, Kevin McCarthy, House Minority Leader, how problematic would that be? How necessary is that? Well, we'll have to see as the investigation unfolds how necessary it is. But look, they are part of this. I mean, there's no question that they are intimately involved with what went on that day. I mean, Kevin McCarthy himself is an interesting example because, of course, in the midst of this assault, he called Trump and pleaded with the president to call these people off. I mean, he was scared for his life. Yes. And he pleaded with the president, stop this assault. You can do this. And that level of principle lasted for Ken Kevin McCarthy about 48 hours. And then after that time, he changed his tune and started denying uh, the, the assault, uh, denying President Trump's involvement, even though he himself had asked the president to stop it. So we should hear from Kevin McCarthy. We should hear from him under oath to explain uh, why he cried out for help from the president because he knew he started this assault and yet a few days later said that he wasn't involved. And talking of other Republicans in the House leadership, we heard some remarkable comments from Elise Stefanik today about Nancy Pelosi's supposed culpability in not defending the Capitol. Uh, have a listen also to Jim Banks, who was supposed to be on that committee until Pelosi blocked him. Have a listen to what he said on Fox. It's not lost on the American people that every word that comes out of Liz Cheney's mouth or Benny Thompson or anyone who's on this committee has been scripted by Nancy Pelosi to, to, expo to, to talk about her narrative without looking at other narratives along the way, like why was the Capitol vulnerable to begin with? We often talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene being the bonkers member of the House GOP. I feel like when I hear Jim Banks speaking about Pelosi or Elise Stefanik, I feel like they're worse because they know better. And yet they're, you know, they're knowingly doing the gaslighting in a way that some of the more bonkers members of their caucus are not. I know Jim Banks. And I can tell you with confidence that he knows better. What you see from people like Adam Kinzinger and Liz Cheney, who serve on this committee, is a tremendous amount of political courage. That's what we need in America today on both sides of the aisle. It's the willingness, the ability to rise above the party pressures, to speak the truth, to speak the truth to power, to do the right thing for the American people. What you're seeing from people, sadly, like Jim Banks and Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and uh, others today is supreme acts of political cowardice, fealty to this ex-president, uh, cowarding, cowering. Uh, to the worst elements in their parties, just to try to gain some political points. I mean, if you just even dissect what Jim Banks said right then, uh, look, we can have a discussion about whether the Capitol was adequately protected. We should have that discussion. That in, has no bearing on what Liz Cheney says when she speaks about the importance of upholding our democratic principles. And the irony of Elise Stefanik to get out there 
and say that Nancy Pelosi is to blame when Elise Stefanik was voting in the House that day against certifying the election. She was voting to undermine the will of the American people. She was voting yes. to support this insurrection while it was going on. She's the one who should be called to testify yeah, because it's... she's far more at fault than Nancy Pelosi. Indeed. Uh, one last question, Congressman. You were in the first company of Marines to enter Baghdad. Uh, Officer Gonell, who testified today, is an Iraq veteran as well. He talked at length about the, you know, the difference in experiences, because at least when he was in Iraq, he knew he was vulnerable to an IED attack, for instance. He didn't expect to be attacked in this way at the Capitol. You've said uh, similar things, that you expected this type of violence while serving in Iraq, but not in America's capital. Do ordinary Americans recognize that we now face a very violent domestic extremist, domestic terrorist movement, and it's armed to the teeth and backed by the former head of state. No, I don't, I don't think most Americans appreciate this at all. Uh, this is the kind of violence that I expected in Iraq every day. We were trying to do an extraordinary thing, a stand up a democracy in a land that's never had it. When I came to serve in Congress, I just planned to participate in a democracy that's lasted for over 200 years. I never imagined this violent assault on our basic fundamental democracy to happen right here in Washington, D.C. Now, I'll tell you, I had an amazing experience just last week when I went and spoke at morning roll call for the Capitol Police, just to share my experience of dealing with post-traumatic stress after Iraq and related to their own experiences of dealing with the mental health fallout from January 6th. And I told them, you were in a, you were in a war zone. Afterwards, several officers came up to me and said that there's only one other person who's even used those words with them before, who said that you were in a war zone with what you saw on January 6th. I hope that by hearing the testimony from these heroic officers today, more Americans appreciate that this was a war zone. Yes. But the point to your question is that a lot of Americans don't. A lot of Americans don't know that. And this is yet another reason why this commission is so important. Yes, it is. Well said. Congressman Seth Moulton, thank you for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Says in deep blue Fulton County, Georgia. Imagine that. You're shocked, I guess. Back in 60 seconds.
One thing we've been stressing on this show for a while now is that the attack on our democracy is not just about restricting voting rights or voter access, but also about who gets to count the votes and who decides the results. It's called election subversion, state legislators attempting to overthrow or undermine the political process by working from within to stack the odds in their favor. President Biden has called it the most dangerous threat to voting and to the integrity of free and fair elections in our history. Never before has there been an attempt by state legislatures to take over the ability to determine who won. Not count the votes, determine who won. We have election officials across the board that they're deciding to push out of the way. That state takeover appears to be starting to happen right now in Georgia. And the groundwork is being laid in Fulton County, where voter turnout is disproportionately Democratic and disproportionately Black. The AJC reports that under the new voting law, Republicans, the voting law that Republicans in Georgia passed this year, the state election board could replace a county's election board after a performance review, audit, or investigation. It could then give a temporary superintendent full authority over vote counting, polling places, and staffing. So, to be clear, the state could audit the Fulton County Election Board, and by whatever standards the state decides to use, they could give the county an unsatisfactory review, fire them, and bring in their own people, likely partisan people. Fulton County has had a history of election difficulties throughout the years, but after the 2020 presidential election, Georgia's uh, Secretary of State, Republican Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, defended the results, saying he found no evidence of widespread election fraud. Of course, state lawmakers from the GOP later made him pay for telling that truth and for refusing Trump's mafia-esque phone call to, quote, find more votes, remember that, by removing him from the state election board. Still, next time round, Raffensperger or no Raffensperger, the GOP in Georgia has a clear plan to find the votes they need and lose the votes they don't. This is not a drill, people. This is not a drill. Joining us now to discuss this is Georgia State Representative B. Nguyen. She's running for Secretary of State in Georgia. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. Uh, the Republican effort to subvert elections continues unabated in your state. Is there anything left for Georgia Democrats to do to stop them, or is this now totally up to Democrats in the United States Senate to try and tackle? Look, I think there is always opportunity for all of us to work at every level to overcome and fight back against this voter suppression and democracy subversion that we are seeing right now. Part of that is electing a Secretary of State who is not going to walk back on his word. The Secretary of State's office sent an independent observer to observe the November election as well as January Senate runoff, and they found no evidence of voter fraud. In fact, watching this unfold on the ground, Fulton County made tremendous improvements to the election process between the primary and general. One of those things was opening up State Farm Arena so that they could have hundreds of voters come in and not wait in those long lines. And so what we're seeing here is nothing new. It is the Secretary of State deflecting responsibility, laying blame on local election boards and Republicans using whatever mechanisms they have to utilize a power grab. This is not local control. There's no evidence that this is necessary. And instead of acting like the leader, the Secretary yes. of State should be, he's the chief elections officer. He is now following this rhetoric that is being pushed by Republicans across our state. Back in March, Gabriel Sterling, the chief operating officer in the office of the Georgia Secretary of State, spoke with my colleague Joshua Johnson about the new Georgia voting law and if he felt it could be used to rig the system. Have a listen. So I want to make sure we're, we're clear about that. Your confidence that political appointees in the legislature, the governor, could not use this new law to essentially rig the system, that that is impossible under the wording of this new law. I think it would be extremely difficult and unlikely. And if somebody tried it, I got a feeling that Joshua, you, and every other journalist in the, in the country would say, what, you, what the heck are you doing? Because it, it, And the thing is, it's a long process. There's a lot of due process involved. It's not like a snap thing that can just happen. But we have years of counties in this state that have made mistakes and, and, and really damaged their voters' abilities to vote. How do you respond to that? Look, the reality is they are laying the groundwork for this to happen. And when they passed Senate Bill 202 earlier this year, we understood that there were dangerous provisions as it pertains to making it harder to vote. But we also knew that the state 
takeover provision was among one of the most dangerous provisions. We have a partisan legislature that's being led by Republicans. Our state board of elections is primarily comprised of Republicans. They can use those power to uh, to nominate a superintendent who has the sole discretion to hire or fire anybody and make all the decisions as it pertains to that local election board. And the role of the local election board is incredibly important. The example that I listed before, using State Farm Arena as an early voting location, that was a solution that the local election board came up with. They are the ones who set early voting locations, early voting hours, and they are the ones who make those decisions to try to figure out how to make it easier and more accessible for voters to vote. And if we are replacing them with a political appointee by a party who has proven to be uninterested in making voting more accessible, we are putting voters in a bad place and, and we can't undo that type of damage. And I wanted to get your thoughts on another big story out of Georgia today. The man charged with killing eight people, mostly women of Asian descent, in a series of horrific spa shootings in March, has pleaded guilty to the murder uh, of four, four in those killings. He received four sentences of life without parole and could still face the death penalty. This is not an isolated incident, obviously. There have been a wave of anti-Asian hate crimes across the country. Uh, just days ago, a New York woman was charged with four attacks on Asian people. How are you feeling about this um, sentencing today? How, how, are you, how are Asian Americans feeling about this? Well, thank you for asking me about that because it's obviously something that's affected our lives here in Georgia as well as across the country. And what I hope for is that the families that were impacted by this can have some form of closure. But what I want to be clear about is accountability is not justice. When we are talking about justice, we're talking about envisioning a world in which a horrific crime like this did not even occur in the first place. And one thing that I do want to address is we don't want to always look at the punitive judicial end of the system as a response to what we're seeing happening in the country. And so this, on the sentencing side, we want to see accountability, but it doesn't matter how many years that the, the perpetrator is sentenced, whether or not there is a hate crime of legislation or, or charge attached to it, the reality is eight people are dead. It wreaks havoc on the community, sustaining lasting trauma that we feel was a crime committed because of race and gender. And it will not take any of those things. But my hope is it does send a message and it helps yes. the family be able to move on. We can only hope. State Representative B. Nguyen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Appreciate it. When we return, the news cycle moves on so quickly it's easy to forget about everything that's happened. Case in point, Israel's raids on Gaza in May that dominated the headlines. We moved on, but now there's a new report out tonight from a prominent human rights organization accusing Israel of war crimes during those days. More on that after this break. Every conflict in Gaza seems to follow the same script. It goes something like this. Israel bombs civilian buildings. Israel gets criticized for it. Israel defends itself by saying something like, hey, we were targeting Hamas militants, definitely not civilians. Then the conflict ends, the world moves on, and few pay attention to the work of human rights groups who stay behind and investigate the aftermath. Yet again, this time round, in the wake of days of escalating violence over the threatened eviction of some Palestinian families in East Jerusalem and Israel's bombardment of Gaza in May, Human Rights Watch now accuses Israel in a shocking new report of committing 
apparent war crimes. The rights group, quote, investigated three Israeli strikes that killed 62 Palestinian civilians where there were no evident military targets in the vicinity. And look, before we go any further, two quick questions that often rear their head. What about Hamas? And why are we so focused on Israel's actions, not theirs? Well, number one, Human Rights Watch does say that Hamas rocket attacks were also apparent war crimes and that they'll be publishing a separate report specifically on the actions of Palestinian armed groups. And number two, we, you and I, the American taxpayer, our government, we don't fund Hamas. We don't arm Hamas. Hamas rockets dropping on Israeli civilians aren't made in America or bought with American money. But Israeli bombs dropping on Palestinian civilians often are. We, at some level, are responsible for what Human Rights Watch today calls Israeli attacks that resulted in high numbers of civilian casualties. Here's how just one of them unfolded. At 1 a.m. on May the 16th, Israel bombed a residential area in Gaza City. A four-minute rain of rockets that destroyed three multi- We were having some technical difficulties there before the break. Thank you for sticking with us. Uh, but moving on, one of the most loaded, most politicized topics of the year happens to be something people don't actually know much about. In fact, when I say critical race theory, rather than thinking about the advanced law school concept, you most likely might think of angry Republicans and angry white parents at school board meetings. That's because the GOP and Fox News have launched a massive campaign to denounce critical race theory and outright ban it in schools, even, even where it's not being taught, because they falsely argue it's teaching students to hate white people. Critical race theory is a divisive ideology that threatens to poison the American psyche. 
all who love freedom and revere the foundational principles of our constitutional republic have a duty to inform themselves of the origins and thought underlying this dangerous ideology and to oppose it openly and robustly. But oppose what exactly? This is a complete waste of political time and energy. But that's what they want to bog us down in these dumb and offensive culture wars, to amplify their false messages, even as journalists like myself try and rebut them. So tonight we want to use the row over critical race theory to do some good, to actually have a proper discussion about the systemic racism in this country that critical race theory focuses on. Whether it's economists ignoring the racism that drives the racial wealth gap and wage gap in this country, or whether it's the racism that's even embedded in our tax code. According to a Brookings study last year, the net worth of a typical white family in 2016, $171,000, is 10 times greater than that of a black family at $17,000. In fact, the ratio of white family wealth to black family wealth is higher today than at the start of the century. There are many reasons for this, but a new book compiling decades of research into the US tax code specifically helps explain one. Quote, the whiteness of wealth, how the tax system impoverishes black Americans and how we can fix it, argues that the seemingly colorblind US tax code actively discriminates against black Americans, furthering an already substantial wealth gap. Joining me now to discuss this is the author of that book, Dorothy Brown. She's a former investment banker, tax attorney, and currently a law professor at Emory University, and also William Spriggs, an economist and former assistant secretary of labor under President Obama. He's currently a professor at Howard University and chief economist for the AFL-CIO. Thank you both for joining me. Dorothy, let me start with you. Your book, The Whiteness of Wealth, has been a long time coming for you. I know you spent years researching this subject. You talk about how you actually thought the tax code was neutral, colorblind, but you discovered that it isn't. It does discriminate against black Americans. How exactly? And is it by design or by accident? So I like to say that Americans bring their racial identities into their tax returns. So when black and white Americans engage in the exact same activity, whether it's owning a home, whether it's getting married, whether it's getting a job, our tax laws are designed to benefit the way white Americans engage in the activity which disadvantage how black Americans engage in the activity because we have a racially separate uh, America. For example, give me one brief, quick example of what that would look like. Yes. What, what's, what's a white racial identity's tax advantage? So let's talk about home ownership, right? Home ownership has propelled uh, middle class, white middle class wealth significantly. And we know the history where the FHA only insured mortgages for white Americans, but I'm talking about today. Today we have tax law that says if you sell your home at a gain, up to half a million dollars, you can get tax free. Well, you would say, well, Dorothy, that applies to black homeowners and white homeowners. But see, homeownership in America is raced. And where is the gain yes. on sales of homes in predominantly white neighborhoods yes. that most white Americans live in, but most black Americans do not? So not only are black homeowners less likely to get that tax-free gain, we are more likely to sell our homes at a loss that is non-deductible. Tax law says gain tax-free. Tax law says loss, no thank you. That's a very good point. Uh, yeah. William, last yeah. year, following the mass protests for racial justice, in the wake of George Floyd's killing and the conversations around racial equity, you wrote an open letter to your economist colleague saying, quote, I am not sure if this moment has gotten to economists enough to see their role as economists in perpetuating the very things everyone was protesting against. What have economists in America missed about their role in perpetuating economic inequality and racial economic inequality in America? Well, economists tend to look at race as biological. When the modern foundations for economics was laid in the late 19th century, the early economists who founded the American Economic Association were all eugenicists. And despite the fact that in the 19th century, America was entrenching its Jim Crow laws, which codified race and made clear to anyone of that period that race is not biological. Race is a legal definition. The point of the Jim Crow laws were to say, here are a group of people who may do this, and here are a group of people who may not do this. And so it's clear that, that we were delineating people, 
this is not biological. The original argument that many people remember in Plessy v. Ferguson, the plaintiff, Plessy, had one white, one black, one, one black great-grandparent. He actually argued to the court, I am white because I only have one black great-grandparent. And I was discriminated against because I didn't get to sit in the white section. The court said, first, you weren't harmed, and no one is harmed because they can, if the state wishes, separate people by race, as long as the accommodations are equal. But further, and the point that everybody misses in that case, further, plus it doesn't matter what you say you are. We don't care that because you only had one black great-grandmother that you identify as white. The state of Louisiana says, you're black, so you're black. And you see throughout the laws, they have to write who's black, who's white. This is not as straightforward as people think yes. until you start reading laws against anti-miscegenation in which they had to define who can marry whom. And then you see this in the race covenants that cover our cities. Who can buy this property, who cannot? And the very careful wording to say who was able to buy property and who, who was not. Yeah, and that's and we're still dealing with that fallout. Dorothy, we've talked on this show about the increased funding for the IRS that Democrats tried to put in their recent uh, reconciliation package and how by not approving this funding, the IRS, uh, the funding for the IRS, it will increase economic inequality. Your piece in The Atlantic this week talks about this, but you also tie in the racial angle on this decision. Tell us about that. Would increasing the IRS's funding be a step towards fixing the tax code and the racism in there? It would, provided that the IRS wouldn't then continue to target higher income black Americans, right? So one of the things I call for is we have to have the IRS giving us racial data on who they audit. Because right now they're auditing earned income tax credit claimants who are dispropor- who disproportionately live in the South and are black. So even though almost half of earned income tax credit recipients are white, There's a disproportionate percentage of low-income black Americans who are being audited by the IRS. So this is a big problem. If we start auditing higher-income Americans who are disproportionately white, we will start to see our enforcement of our tax laws fair. Or as I like to say, Republicans support defunding the police when the police would otherwise go after rich white taxpayers. Yes. Yeah, the tax police, they have no problems defunding. Uh, William, as it stands, the wage gap between black and white workers in America is wider than it was in 1970, which is kind of crazy to think about, given how much talk there is about the progress that's been made when it comes to racial justice. You were part of the Labor Department under President Obama. While you were there, the National Equal Pay Task Force was established, which was focused on equal pay for women. Why was equity and racial pay not addressed back then as well? And how has it worsened since then? Well, the gap between men and women is more extreme than the racial wage gap, and that's part of the reason. Occupational segregation by gender is more extreme than by race, and that's the other part of it. And the other part is just the difficulty, the political economic difficulty of having the conversation about the legacy of the way in which occupation and occupational hierarchies exist. And that political economic reality haunts us still. The tendency when trying to explain black-white differences is to default to it's something about the skill gap in black America. It's not to look at these structural issues like occupation. And yet occupation and industry are the key key divides. And this is the legacy of the ability to prevent blacks from obtaining certain occupations, or if they do, to limit their operation. As an example, here in the Washington DC metropolitan area, we're home to about the same size of an IT workforce as in Silicon Valley. Yet this IT workforce is 25% black. The workforce that's in Silicon Valley isn't 2% black. The share of blacks earning degrees in computer science is about 11%. 
So you, 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 you look at it and you understand that blacks have been confined to that sector of the industry that's dominated by the public sector. Cybersecurity, that's what we see a lot of people yes. do in this area. And that Good point. is done by people with the public sector. No, it's a very good, very good observation. Um, Dorothy, one last question to you on the topic of quote unquote equity. I want to play a clip of Congressman Ralph Norman of South Carolina. Have a listen. It's now about uh, press versus the oppressor tearing down. Uh, quality means equity. Now examine that. Let's put it in a sports figure. Imagine telling Michael Jordan, whether it was at North Carolina or the Bulls, that he couldn't start off because it was not equal. I mean, Dorothy, tearing down quality for equity, obviously a distorted framing of critical race theory of the fight for racial justice and equity. But why do you think there's so much fear, so much resistance when it comes to this issue, so much manipulation and fear mongering from Republicans? Well, it's designed to get out the base on a year where Trump isn't on the ballot that would get out uh, the base, right? So what we, what they want to talk about basically is teaching history. It's not critical race theory. It's teaching race history. And what happens in the absence of talking about this is black Americans, for example, pay higher taxes. So imagine Michael Jordan paying higher taxes because he's black. That's not fair either. So we need to fix this. So, you know, it's it's nonsense, but it's designed to drive the base on a like I said, when you don't have Trump on the ballot. So any fear, any race fear mongering the Republicans can do, they're doing. And I think you need to basically yep. cause people to say, oh, you support teaching uh, the enslaved were happy. That's what you want. That's what you want your kids to be taught. Let's talk about that. So it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Uh, Dorothy Brown, William Spriggs, appreciate both of your uh, thoughts and observations tonight. Thank you both for coming on the show. If there's one thing we've learned about Donald Trump, it's that he demands total loyalty from those around him, but feels no obligation to return the favor. Jeff Sessions, one of the first major politicians to endorse Trump, then unceremoniously fired and dubbed Mr. Magoo. Rex Tillerson served as Trump's Secretary of State, then unceremoniously fired and dubbed dumb as a rock. Bill Barr, Omarosa, John Kelly, Kirsten Nielsen. The list goes on and on and on. And at this point, only a fool would bow to Trump and expect anything in return. Enter George P. Bush. He lavished praise on Trump in hopes that the former president would endorse him for Texas Attorney General, even after Trump ripped apart every member of Bush's extended family. Well, yesterday, surprise, surprise, Donald Trump endorsed a different attorney general candidate in Texas, the incumbent, Ken Paxton. George, George P., you of all people should have anticipated this. I mean, who could forget your Uncle W's classic, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, uh, won't get fooled again? Well, you just got fooled again, big time. As in, I just sold out my entire family and all I got was this lousy koozie. Have a ginger ale on me, pal. You're going to need it going forward. Cheers. That does it for me tonight. Make sure to join us on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on TikTok, on, on, TikTok, on Facebook, all of them. And I'll see you back here on TV tomorrow night, live at 7 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Choice from MSNBC on Peacock. From me, good night.